Hi everyone, Brian here. Wanted to let you know that I've just posted a new revision of my book, The Fundamentals of Control Theory. The link to it is in the description, and if you're already one of my supporters through Konos, you can just download it for free right away. If you aren't a supporter yet, you won't be able to actually see the post. However, you can become a supporter for any amount of money you choose, even if it's just a single dollar. It's completely up to you. But once you are a supporter, you're in the club and you'll get an email when I release updates in the future, and you'll be able to download all future releases for free. But if you want to stick around for a few minutes, I'll let you know what you can expect from this release. First off, I fixed the two problems that were reported by my readers. One was that I was using the wrong single tick marks, and the other, I chose a typography that made it difficult to read. Both of those are now corrected. But mostly I added the first few sections to chapter two, which is on transfer functions. When you, as an engineer, are trying to describe your system, you have several options. One option is that you can draw pictures and use words to explain what your system is doing. Now this is a great method for describing the concept of your system, but if you want to develop a controller around your system, then words and pictures don't help too much. So we develop mathematical models in the form of differential equations. And once you have your differential equations, you then get to make another choice. Do you keep your model as differential equations or do you manipulate them into another representation? The two most popular are transfer functions and state space representation. Obviously, this chapter is going to talk about transfer functions because that's what the title is. Now, the formal definition is a transfer function is the Laplace transform of the impulse response of a linear time invariant system with a single input and single output when you set the initial conditions to zero. They allow us to connect several systems in series by performing convolution through simple multiplication. Now, I made that definition difficult to follow on purpose, mostly because other books have equally confusing statements, but also because it gives me an opportunity to walk through each part explicitly so that you understand this definition by the end of the chapter. We start by describing a linear time invariant system. Even though you have dozens of mathematical operations to choose from, if you want to model your system as LTI, then you really only have these six. But if you can model your system with some combination of these six operations, then you can make predictions about how the output of your system will change as you change the input. That's because LTI systems obey homogeneity, superposition, and time invariance. Homogeneity is the scaling principle. If you scale the input by two, then the output will also scale by two. Superposition is the adding principle. If you add two different inputs together, then the output is the summed output of each individual input. And finally, time invariance is the shifting principle. If you delay your input by time t, then the output will also be delayed by time t. Now, no real system is linear time invariant, but a lot of systems can be approximated by an LTI model very accurately which is cool because then we can do things like represent them as transfer functions. To find out why, we first need to talk about the impulse function. An impulse function is a signal that is infinitely tall and infinitesimally thin. Even though it has no thickness, the definition of it states that the area under the curve is one unit, so we can still do useful things with it like take an integral. If you say that the impulse is force, then when you divide by mass and integrate, you find that you've applied an instantaneous velocity to your mass. This is very similar to hitting a block with a hammer, and the resulting velocity of the block is referred to as the impulse response of the system. Now this is kind of neat, because if our system is LTI, then we know we can apply two impulses of different magnitudes, and we can just scale and sum the individual impulse response outputs to get the total response of the system. So if we hit the block three times in quick succession, the response might look something like this. The problem is you can't generate a perfect impulse in real life. So the question is, how can we use this knowledge to determine the response to an arbitrary input? And we do that with the convolution integral. Convolution is usually taught as this integral that does this rather bizarre thing. You take one of your input functions and flip it around and then slide it across the other function and add up the area under the two curves as you slide across. Now this is a great visual, but it doesn't do much for understanding why this works. So we'll build it up from scratch for you so you understand. Remember we had this arbitrary input f of t. And if we magnify the very beginning of the function, like the first infinitesimally small length of d tau, then we can claim that that area under the curve is just the height of the function times d tau. We can then replace that area with an impulse function that we scale to have the same area. 
Essentially, we remove the first bit of f of t and replace it with an impulse that represents it. Now we know what the response will be for that first d tau. It will just be the scaled impulse response. And if we zoom in, it'll look like an impulse response. But since d tau is so incredibly small, the actual response is near nothing. But if we move on to the next d tau and perform the same replacement, then we'll get two really tiny impulse responses. Remember, this system is modeled as LTI, so we can sum those two responses together. And if we keep this up for the entire function, we'll be left with a bunch of really tiny impulse responses for each d tau that we can sum together to get the total response of the system. This is discrete convolution, and it's how computers solve the problem. However, all we have to do is shrink d tau down by taking the limit as it goes to zero, and we're left with an integral, the convolution integral. So when you're flipping an impulse response and sliding it across an arbitrary input f of t, and then summing it all together, you're really performing an infinite number of steps that we just laid out. It's pretty awesome. Now to find out how this applies to transfer functions, you'll just have to wait. I'm working on finishing out this chapter on transfer functions right now, and we'll post in about a month. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and thanks for the support.